I have such a hard time trying to figure out why people are afraid of the things that God has created. Well, of course, people can misuse it for fortune telling and so forth, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the influences, the vibrations that come from these planets. You know, it's a, such an important part. Like, as we showed you last week, the days of the week are named after the seven planets. And the moon controls the tides, the sun controls life. And you can't just believe that everything up there is just rolling around in some billiard ball with no reason and no purpose. Let me show you something. Do you know what the Greek word for that universe is? K-O-S-M-O-S. -O -O you know that. Cosmos. Cosmos. And do you know what that word means? It means law. Everything up there has a purpose and a reason and it affects man. It affects the way we live. Jesus Christ said in Luke 22:10, when you see the man, now let's take a look at what he said so that we get an idea. When you see the man carrying, that's the man carrying the pitcher of water. Okay. Now that's Aquarius. Don't think Jesus didn't know what he's talking about. He sure did. He's talking about this age right now. So that's now. Okay. When you see the man carrying the pitcher of water, this is Luke 22:10. He says, enter into the house, and the house is you. Enter into yourself. Go to the upper room, and the upper room is your higher consciousness. And he said, there you will be fed by him. That's where, you'll have the, that's where you'll have the Passover, in the upper room. And so now we understand, as we realize the movement of these tremendous universal things that God has created, that Jesus was talking about the man with the pitcher of water, which is the Christ, pouring out. Don't you remember what it says? What does it say in the Bible? I will pour out my spirit upon you. What I'm trying to get through to you is that God has created in the universe a blueprint of life, a blueprint of the movement of the universe, a blueprint of what life is all about and how to overcome that which is the evil and that which is oppressive and rise up to that which is heavenly. What's going to happen is that, according to the Institute of the, in France, in the year 2010, this Aquarian age is going to peak, the year 2010. And basically what the uh, age of Aquari Aquarius is, is the, is the constellation of the planet Uranus, U-R-A-N-U-S. That is called the Son of Heaven or the God of Heaven. Now just think, the Christ is supposed to return, split the eastern sky, and cast down Satan into prison. Isn't it interesting that Uranus gave birth to Saturn, and Saturn overthrew Uranus, and then was cast out of heaven by the son of Uranus. Do you understand what, all of, what I'm saying? This is the mythology of the constellations, the stars in the sky. Uranus had a relationship with Gaia, G-A-E-A, -E which is Mother Earth. So Uranus had an intercourse relationship and had sons and daughters with Mother Earth. This is mythology of the planets. He gave birth to Saturn. Saturn overthrew Uranus, and I'll tell you more about that. And then Saturn was driven out of heaven and cast down by the sons of Uranus or the sons of God. Now, understand what we're talking about here. The age of Aquarius peaking in 2010, 19 years from now, would be the son of heaven, or the god of heaven, Uranus, which is moving in its patterns right now as we're talking, moving into the eastern sky, overwhelming that which is the negative influences of Saturn and setting people free. Look up your redemption draweth nigh. Because all of these things have influences. They influence people. There's no way you can say they don't. They do. They influence people. There's a vibration. There's, there's frequencies that come out of these things. And they have their influences, and the Bible talks about it. I mean, in, 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 in Job 38, 30 of the Bible, it says, Can you bring forth Masroth? Can, can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? Look at it, Job 38. Job 38, 32. Uh, Job 38, 31, can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? Well, if the planets didn't have any influence on you or me, why does it say it does in the Bible? 
And it's the sweet influences of Pleiades. Pleiades is the star cluster in the constellation Taurus. It means the influences to the ego, the influences to ambition, the influences to the macho strength. Can you put a halter on that? Well, if, if the, it says, or can you loose the bonds, the bands of Orion? Orion's another constellation. Why is the Bible saying that these planets have an influence if they don't? They do. And what the Aquarian age is, is what the kids call the harmonic convergence, is a time when there's going to be tremendous peace. And that's why people are going to be caught up in, in, in compassion for animals, compassion for the ecology, compassion for one another. I don't, I don't, I don't see there's any way of, of, of this war that everybody's frightened about. And, you know, anybody can be wrong. But I mean, this is the age we're moving closer and closer to this time of universal peace and individuality and life. And it all happens within you, because as the universe is out there, so it is in here. See? So what happens, see, in the story, let me go back to these cast of characters over here, so you get a, a better idea. We'll, we'll show you this character. Uranus, which is the god of heaven, okay? Saturn, which is, of course, the star, uh, the sun, one of the fallen kind of, I guess you'd say like, uh, so like the prodigal son. Uranus casts his children into Hades, which is the lower depths. Now, this is the mythology of the, of the stars, of, 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 uh, of, of uh, the zodiac. He shuts them up in a lower earth or imprisons them. Now, does that ring a bell with you? Here it is, God shuts up that which is Saturn into the lower earth, not out of hatred for them, but out of love for us. If you remember in Revelation 20, verse 2 and 3, it says, Satan is bound a thousand years. Okay, that's the negative aspects of Saturn. <laughs> what that's telling you is that due to the effect, the planetary effect, the movement in the universe that God has ordained, Uranus then overrides the effect of that which is Saturn or Satan, and we live in Christ consciousness because there is none of the negativity of the lower mind. Okay? There, there's, there's good reason to believe, folks, that Satan and Saturn are one and the same. It says in Revelation 27, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and he shall go out and deceive the nation. So obviously what's being said here is in an, in an astronomical way, at that point, Saturn will move out of the influences of Uranus and then that negative influence will come back down to Earth again. Okay? So, so then we see how the prophecies in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, can be fulfilled and are being fulfilled by the activities of the comets and the, uh, the excuse me, the, the planets and the constellations in the universe, which, as God has ordained them. So right now, as we're talking, Uranus is swinging through the heavens to its celestial throne. And, and we have to make a cosmic rendezvous. I mean, and you make that cosmic rendezvous by lifting yourself up into that om, up into that nothingness, up into that higher realm of, of, of communion with that which is God. You make, a, you make a communion with that which is the universal strength. That's why Jesus Christ said, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. Because if your eye is single, you raise yourself up into that higher consciousness, and that's where you make that rendezvous, with, which is the celestial message that is coming out of the universe, ordained and created by God. And that basically is the age of Aquarius. You know, I think it's very interesting that, you know, many people in church circles get so upset if you start talking about the zodiac, even though the zodiac is, a, is an extremely real principle that is inherent in all life, and it's been so for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. But I want to tell some of you folks that may feel a little strange about this, if you have an older Bible, you know, some of these Bibles, you know, go back maybe 100 years old, take a look in your Bible, open to the book of Matthew, okay, and if you have one of those older Bibles, you're liable then to see the face of a man because Matthew is the Aquarian Gospel. It's Aquarius. And it means the wisdom of God overwhelms the intellect of man. That's why Matthew is the Aquarian Gospel. And in the old Bibles, they have a picture of the face of a man. Then go to the book of Mark and you'll see there a picture of a lion. And it's Leo. Okay, And the idea there is the spirit of God overwhelms the human spirit. Okay, So there we have the book of Matthew is represented by a man, Aquarius. The book of Mark is represented by a lion, 
which is Leo. Then if you go to the um, book of Luke, you'll see the picture of a bull. And that is the power of God overwhelms the power of the animal nature of man. So then Matthew is represented by the face of a man Aquarius. Mark is represented by a lion, which is Leo. Luke is represented by, uh, uh, by a bull, which is Taurus. And finally, in the uh, book of John, you'll see an eagle, which is Scorpio. Now, Scorpio is in its lower nature a scorpion, but in its higher nature it's Aquila, the eagle, which is the uh, highest consciousness which overwhelms that which is the carnal mind of men. So you, you go ahead and check in, in some of your real old Bibles, and you open up, you'll see it, because they printed them that way. That's how, that's how tied into the Zodiac early Christianity was. And you'll see the Matthew, the face of the man, it's Aquarius. You'll see Mark, the, uh, the, the lion, it's Leo. You'll see Luke, the bull, it's Taurus. And you'll see John, the eagle, it's Scorpio. So, so try it. Take a look at it, and, and you'll find it. And once you see that, then you realize that if you're trying to understand the Bible without understanding the zodiac and understanding the constellations, you're never going to get anywhere. Because the whole Bible is built around the 12 constellations of the zodiac, which is the 12 disciples the 12 apostles, the 12 gates to the city. Even uh, Jacob named his children after the 12 signs of the zodiac. He had 12 sons and one daughter, but two of his sons were um, uh, twins, which is Simeon and Levi, Gemini. So you, you, and then, of course, you take the number seven in the Bible, which is from the seven visible planets, the seven planets that they could see at that time. So you can't get away from it, and if you're not looking at it, you're missing so very, very much. And I'm going to start, you know, to try to tell you the story. I hope we can get some of it done and we'll go on with it because it's so interesting because we're going to trace the activities of these planets and show you how they do represent biblical characters. It doesn't say anything didn't happen. It says everything that happens on Earth is coordinated with that which happens in the universe because it's all one. It's all a spiral. It's all this Kundalini action, you see. And you, and you cannot separate yourself from it. That's the problem. We've separated ourselves from it, and all we've done is read books. But you can't do that. Before we get into this, and, and this is really going to get extremely interesting for you, okay? And it's a real adventure. I'm going to show you the mythology of the Zodiac, and then compare it with the Bible, and you're going to see stuff that's going to absolutely astound you that you never knew. And, and, and you're really going to go into shock and, and start, I think, opening yourself up and I'm not talking about fortune telling, I'm talking about that which is in the heavens and has been drawn in the heavens for six, seven thousand years. This program comes to you from the Christian Village Church. And in order to stay here, we have folks that every month they send something in. We send you an envelope and we put a hidden meanings teaching in that envelope and you return it with whatever you can. Uh, some month if you can't, well that's okay, it's no problem. Maybe the next month or the month after. You know, we're not going to chase after you or hound you or do anything like that. But if you could call at the end of the show, 609-971-0537, well, it would really be a tremendous help if you say, you know, send us the envelope and, and, and we'll try to uh, get that to you. And if you just want information about the church or, you know, what's going on, the, the tapes that we have, we'll send you a kit with information in it. The telephone number, and you can call at the end of the show, is 609-971-0537. 609-971-0537. The Christian Village Church is located at 134 Route 9 in Forked River, right next to Mrs. Walker's Ice Cream Parlor. On the other side, there's a Chinese restaurant, and we're right smack in the middle of them. And we have a beautiful place to come downstairs to and spend time. Sunday morning at 11 a.m., I teach the hidden meanings of Jesus Christ. Sunday evening, I teach the book of Revelation, the hidden meanings of that. Tuesday evening, we have meditation, and you almost have to get a reservation. That's really where you lift yourself up into that Aries up into the Lamb of God that takes away the coldness of life and brings you the sunshine of your life. Uh, Thursday evening we have meditation instructions for beginners. Friday evening I'm there with a new series which we're sharing with you here on television, but it gets a lot more in depth, and that is the Zodiac and the Bible. And then pretty soon on Sunday evenings, after we finish with the book of Revelation, we're going to be comparing the life and birth of Hare Krishna, the life and birth of Jesus Christ. What we have deprived ourselves of knowing is, is just unfortunate, you know. Okay. Let's see what, how much we can get in here, and we'll probably have to continue this. We're looking at that which is Aquarius, and there is, in the age of Aquarius, okay, Aquarius is the man, 
okay, which symbolizes the, the intellect, the humankind. And Aquarius, according to the mythology of the Zodiac, is ruled by Uranus, which would be the god of heaven, or by Saturn, which in this biblical context now, because there's so many variations of this thing, is darkness. Okay, so there, right then and there, you start to see a pattern in the sky. Because remember, this Uranus now is going to be coming and splitting the eastern sky in the year 2010, in about 19, in about 19 years from now, and will herald the age of Aquarius in which Jesus said, when you see the man with the pitcher of water, go to the upper room and I'll, I'll meet you there in the house. Now, here then, Uranus is the God of heaven and the Son of heaven, and he is making his way right now to that eastern sky where he will then overwhelm that which is Saturn and that which is darkness. Now, we're comparing this mythologically to that which is biblical, all right? So we have the two main characters that we're going to be talking about, Uranus and Saturn. Now, Saturn is also known as, let me give you another name here, Kronos. Do you recognize that word? Kronos is time. That's the great oppressor, isn't it? That's the thing I think that gets us more freaked out than anything. Time. Oh, I got to do this right away. Oh, I got to do that right away. And you see this chromatic and all of that stuff. Kronos and Saturn are one of the same. So as we use these, you know, you get to be able to understand the drama. Because the drama that you're going to see that we're going to lead you in here is going to be acted out. You can see it in the heavens and you can follow the progress of it right through this Aquarian age as Uranus moves into the eastern sky. Okay. Now, what it says in the mythology of the Zodiac, that in the beginning there was chaos. Everything was formless. And Gaia, now Gaia is Mother Earth, gave birth to Uranus. Isn't that interesting? Mother Earth gave birth to the God of Heaven. Okay. Now, basically, it's interesting because that's very similar to Genesis where... Gaia is spirit and mother, and as earth receives the seed and gives birth to all of that which is new, which we say all things are of God. There's another very interesting thing here, and that is Gaia. Let me, let me see if we can mark that down for you here. Gaia being the mother earth or that which is the spirit, okay, giving birth to God. Gaia gives birth to God. Okay, now what's so interesting about that, this is in the early stages of mythology of the Zodiac, okay? It, it's very similar to Mary giving birth to Jesus, or Devaki giving birth to Krishna, or Isis giving birth to Horus. There are three very prominent virgin births here. Notice there is no impregnation of any kind. There are three very important virgin births here that we have to consider. Of course, that is Mary and Jesus in the Christian religion. Okay, in Egypt, it was Isis and Horus. And of course, with Jesus, the, the stepfather was Joseph. In Egypt, the stepfather was Osiris. And then, of course, in Krishna, we have another virgin birth. And this is Devaki, D-E-V-A-K-I, giving birth to Krishna. And let me see if I can, I, I probably will forget how to spell the name of, uh, yeah, Vasudeva was, that was the joke, Vasudeva. And what, I'll share with you something about the Krishna birth in, in upcoming weeks. But so there we have, in each one of these instances, through Jesus in the Bible, Horus and Krishna from the most ancient times, we have what resulted in the birth of God, or the birth of the Savior. And we have Mary, Isis, and Devaki. We have Joseph, Osiris, and Vasudeva. Same exact story. Each one impregnated, okay? Each one gave birth uh, with, without seminal discharges, it says about um, Krishna. Each one gave birth through a virgin concept of birth. So, it, literally what happened is God was both husband and son. And, <laughs> and we'll go into that. But here with Gaia giving birth when the universe was void and formless, as it says in, in the early mythology of uh, uh, of the Zodiac, what you have is out of nothing, there comes something. Out of nothing, there comes everything, okay? <clears throat> so now we have then the continuation of the Jesus, Mary, Krishna, Devaki, Isis, Horus stories. Because what's interesting, if you come back over here, 
Notice here that in each one of these instances, Mary becomes impregnated by the Holy Spirit and the angel announces that to her. The same with Isis. Isis lies on the dead body of Osiris and conceives through his spirit and Devaki is impregnated by the spirit and she gives birth to Christ. So in each case, the Holy Spirit or the God Spirit impregnates Mary, Isis, and Devaki. So that is the husband, the real husband then of these three is actually God, and yet they give birth to that which is also God. So God becomes both the Father and the Son. With me? <laughs> All right. But it is interesting, and it's part also of uh, the same situation that we have here, which is Uranus... Uh, okay, and uh, Gaia. So we, we, we could actually put, let's just put this up on the list here, Frank, because we have the same thing here, because here we have Gaia, okay, and she gives actually birth to the earth and also to God. But of course, this is the beginning of things, and there's no stepfather involved in this at all. This is the, the ultimate beginning, and that's in the mythologies of the zodiac, okay. It says, as God of the sky, Uranus impregnated his mother, okay, which is Gaia. God gave the seed to the earth by making a gentle rain fall upon her genitals. It is the gentle rain from above that causes the seed to become fertile and give forth new life. That's really the beginning of the mythology of the zodiac. Now, we're talking about the stars that you see in the sky. There's this tremendous story that's written about the stars and the constellations that you see in the sky that are acting this drama out right in front of your eyes. And as you follow the Bible and identify some of the symbols and some of the characters in the Bible with these planets and so forth, with, with, with Jesus Christ as the Son, with, with God the Father as Uranus, with, with that which is uh, Satan as Saturn, you can see the whole drama being acted out in the sky. And there is much, much, much documentation to show that these, these stories are really, really... Uh, one of the same. Now let's take a look at our friend here. Have you got this? The best thing is maybe if you want to start coming out on Friday nights and when we really get into this and you can get all of this stuff down because you, you should be able to follow what's going on with a scorecard throughout the entire world now, especially you've seen so many changes made, you know, of things that are happening because of the influence of this Aquarian factor. Now the point here is that Uranus and Gaia give birth to Saturn. Well, that's one aspect of the human personality. That's Satan, see. Saturn is a star. As you know that, you can look up and see the star. Okay. Now, why do we then connect Saturn and Satan? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but here's one of them. Lucifer, who was born out of God, who was an offspring of God. Lucifer, that word Lucifer means bright, what? Star. Okay. Is that interesting? And Saturn, if we look at Saturn, it is the most remote star in the heavens. It is the most remote star of the seven visible planets, that highest point. Now, if you go to this, Ezekiel, I don't want to do so much drawing, but it's, it's important that you see this. Ezekiel 28, 14. Then you can come over here, Frank. What's it saying? Now, we're talking about Saturn and Lucifer. Lucifer means bright star. Remember? And Lucifer was God's closest, okay? And Saturn then becomes that remote star. What's it say about Lucifer? You were upon the holy mountain of God, the highest, most remote place. So there we have good reason to start to see a connection between Lucifer and Saturn as being one of the same. Okay, you won't always see that in your astrological charts or astronomical charts, but I'm talking about as you look at the mythology of Saturn, the mythology of Uranus and Gaia, mythology of Lucifer, you see a tremendous connection. We got to go. 